Darwin the chef cook dished up 13 points, 15 assists and 5 steals, simultaneously handing out just desserts to Philadelphia in the 123-89 to smashing. Rumour has it that when asked about all of the points that he scored in the paint during this game and just how he did it, Darwin the chef cook responded, well, you'll never, never know if you never, never go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, For our Australian listeners, that is absolute gold. (laughs) Hello to Daryl Summers if you're listening. Uh, Anybody that doesn't get that reference, it was a great slogan that the Northern Territory Tourist Commission must have had back in the day here in Australia. I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. (laughs) I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away Jordan was going to be a big-time scorer. And showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB86, celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls 1986 NBA season. And now your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to another episode of NB86. We're up to episode 8 in our series, Aaron. Thanks again for being a part of the show, mate, and welcome to you. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. The NBA didn't feel the other need to celebrate the 30-year anniversary of the greatest player of all time, so that's where we step in. Yeah, right. Good point. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're an existing listener, thanks for joining us again. NBA News Notes and Quotes January 8th through 22nd, 1986. In East Rutherford, New Jersey, the Nets prevailed 106-99 to over the visiting Bucks of Milwaukee. Albert King, who was the brother of Bernard, dropped 24 points for the winners, 9 in the last quarter. Daryl Dawkins added 20, so too Darwin Cook. No, not the Northern Territory chef. Sid Moncrief scored 25 points for the 25-13 and 13 Bucks. Milwaukee's coach Don Nelson told reporters that Jeff Lamp wasn't switched on and therefore he missed the game with flu-like symptoms. Just add the Northern Territory chef to the list of players that I've never heard of before. Yeah, Darwin Cook. I've heard the name, but only in research for NB86 in reading the recaps of games. So another new one to me. So uh, we'll welcome Darwin Cook into the fold. Um, the visiting Cavaliers were routed by the Boston Celtics 126-95. to Bird had 25 points, McHale 24, and Robert the Chief Parish 22. Edgar Jones, who was a star at Nevada College, I've since learnt, led the Cavs with 20 points, and the Celtics' record with the win was 26 and 8. At Indiana, Sacramento fought back from a 20-point deficit, and they eked out an 88 to 87 win. Mike Woodson, who's currently an assistant coach with the LA Clippers, as we record this in 2016, he had 25 points for the Kings. And friend of the show, Eddie Johnson, episode 41 of the podcast, hit three clutch buckets in the final minutes, including a 12-foot game winner. Now, how's this one, mate? Minutia lovers unite. Sacramento's Herb Williams had 18 points in this game, but most impressively, it included his nailing of an 86-foot Hail Mary to end the first half. And this shot, as soon as I read that, something popped up in my memory about NBA Entertainment's Awesome Endings video release. And in a segment titled Bombs Away, I'd always wondered what year that shot took place. And Herb Williams, there you go. that was it. I sent you a link to it just earlier tonight before we got recording. And it's an absolute Hail Mary, almost a 90-footer. Yeah. Admittedly, I was wondering why you sent me the link to that. I had seen awesome endings, but I could not recall that shot by Herb. I remembered the one that immediately followed at the underhand from about 70 feet from Dennis Johnson. Remembered that one, but I couldn't remember Herb's fling from the other end. Yeah, I'd always wondered when that happened, and thankfully, NB86 has come through with the goods. That question has now been answered, so that was pretty awesome to note. Um, the Suns outshone the Bullets 109-97 to at Phoenix. It was a fourth straight loss for Washington, whilst the Suns improved to 12-20 and on the season. The Bullets' top scorer was Charles Jones with 17 points, and for Phoenix, Larry Nance had 29 points and 14 rebounds. Alvin Adams contributed a near triple-double with 16 points, 11 boards, and 8 assists. And on the following day, the 9th of January, Michael Jordan was put back into a walking cast. Well, not Michael in total, but (laughs) his foot was put back into a walking cast. It's already uncomfortable enough, but to try and force a (laughs) six-foot-six man into a cast, a bit unfair, mate. That's a big walking cast. It is. After Dr. Hefferon found that the fracture in his foot hadn't healed yet, 
His return was yet again pushed back to the beginning of February in 1986. And this episode will round out nicely with another mention of Dr. Hefferon. In a tale of two cities, Atlanta at Detroit defeated the Pistons 110-99. It was the Hawks' 11th win in its last 15 games, and they were 19-15 and 15 at this stage. Whilst for the ST Ruggling Detroit Pistons, they suffered their 11th loss in its last 13 contests, and they were 16 and 20. Now, how's this for a stat line, mate? Doc Rivers dialed up 29 points, seven rebounds, six assists, and seven steals. Pretty impressive. Neek had 26 points and 11 rebounds. Joe Dumas was the only Piston to fire with 21 points, and Detroit's seven foot five Chuck Nevitt had eight points and three rebounds in an, and I quote, all reserve lineup, end quote, that took to the court during the third quarter when the team trailed by 27 points. Wow. Closing out the 9th of January, Seattle's Tom Chambers was placed on the injured list due to a broken leg. He returned February 2, however, had not played since December 28 of 1985. Straight on to the 10th of January, mate, Boston improved to 27-8 and eight with a 7-point win, 115-108. to 108 against the visiting Atlanta Hawks, and it snapped the team's five-game win streak. Larry Legend had 29 points, DJ, Dennis Johnson, and Kevin McHale had 24 apiece, and they moved to 16-1 and at the Boston Garden. Dominic Wilkins led all scorers with 34 points. At home, the Mavericks moved to 500 on the season at 16-16, and beating Phoenix 117-104. to Dallas's top scorer was Mark Aguirre with 26 points. Rolando Blackman, former podcast guest, episode 70, what a great guy he is, had 25 points, also playing the role of stat stuffer with 11 boards, 8 assists and 3 steals. The 12 and 21 Suns had 7 players score in double digits, but still came up short. On the same day, at Milwaukee, number 2 pick in the 84 NBA draft, Sam Bowie, suffered a suspected fractured bone in his left leg. Now, it actually turned out to be a bruised bone. However, it's a very similar injury to what he suffered whilst playing college basketball with Kentucky. The incident happened during Portland's 95-89 to loss. Bowie missed almost exactly a month, then he returned to play three games before missing the rest of the season, and all but five games in 1987, due to continued career-threatening injuries. It's funny when you hear, read, or see certain things about a, a player, and then from that point on, every time you hear that player's name, you associate that thing that you've read or seen or heard about that guy. Every time now that I see or hear Sam Bowie's name, I think of that sound that his leg made in Portland. That was shocking. Shocking. That was on that fantastic documentary about Sam Bowie and his early NBA career. During the 124-102 to blowout win over the visiting Indiana Pacers, the Lakers' Kareem Abdul-Jabbar surpassed 34,000 career points. He became the first player to achieve that feat. He had 31 points in the game. Steve the Swinger Stepanovich led the Pacers with 18 points and 8 rebounds. And Terrence Stansbury, my goodness, mate, the shameless self-promotion is off the charts today. The wheels are about to fall off. They are indeed. Episode 58, great chat there with Terrence Stansbury. He had 14 points and 7 assists for the 10 and 25 Pacers. In other NBA news that day, Cleveland's Phil Hubbard was placed on the injured list as a torn ligament on his right wrist had not healed well enough. He'd be sidelined for the remainder of this 86 season, and for what it's worth, he hadn't played a game since December 20 of 1985. Podcast favourite? Hashtag old mother. Um, on the 11th of January, the Clippers visited Chicago in front of only 9,469 fans, and Chicago won in a high-scoring affair, 132 to 123. The Bulls improved to 15 and 23 on the season. For Chicago, Orlando Woolridge had 28 points and 7 rebounds, Quinton Daly 20 points, Charles Oakley had 7 boards, and Johnny Pax 14 points and 6 assists. And for the Clippers, Norm Nixon had a great game with 26 points and 9 assists, Cedric Maxwell 21 points, and Rory White in his fourth season had 20 points. Now, mate, I found a very curious piece in the Chicago Tribune in the NBA Roundup column on this date. Now, this is quite startling when I read this. I never knew anything about it. Even though Detroit lost their game 102-101 to to Philadelphia in Detroit, the team was just happy that Isaiah Thomas took to the floor because the previous day, Pistons GM Jack McCloskey, a.k.a. Trader Jack, shot down a radio rumor that suggested Isaiah was going to quit basketball. I was stunned when I read that, due to a November knee injury and the fact that his team was playing very sluggishly at this point of the season. So quite remarkable that there was talk that had to be squashed that Isaiah was going to quit the game altogether. All brand new information, which you know, one of many 
brand new pieces of information that we've uh, uncovered during our extensive research. We do what we can, mate. Now, uh, there's also some fabulous follow-up to that possible quitting of the game by Isaiah, and uh, I'll get to that in a few more days' time when we recap an interesting turn of events. Uh, back to the game itself, though. Barkley had 26 points and 13 rebounds, and Dr. J had 24 points. Isaiah had 12 points and 9 assists, and Kelly Trapuka led the Pistons with 21 points. It was at about this time that the Bulls' content was increasingly decreasing as the Chicago Bears started their tilt toward their famed Super Bowl 20 win in 1986, otherwise known as the 85 Bears, I guess. Even... <laughs> <laughs> You've got me mid-sip of coffee. Thank you. Even Bob Sakamoto's article about the Bulls game versus the Clippers was dubbed Chicago versus Los Angeles Part 1 with Part 2 to follow the following Sunday at Soldier Field as the Bears took on the Rams in the NFC title game. Many of the positives for this Bulls team were being overshadowed by the Chicago Bears, including Kyle Macy's league-leading assist-to-turnover ratio and the good play of Gervin, Daly and Woolridge from this game in particular. Speaking of that NFC title game, mate, I can't wait to break that down in NF86 in our next recording. Oh, baby. <laughs> after trailing 37-33 after one period, the Bulls peeled off 14 straight points and a 19-2 run to blow the game open in the second term. Oldham played inspired basketball with 11 points and three blocks in the first half alone. The following day, January 13, the Dinker of Dunk, mm. Minute Bowl, returns to Chicago Stadium on January 14 with the Washington Bullets. And every seven-footer or Dinker tribesman <laughs> would get in to the game for free in one of the coolest <laughs> promo nights we have ever seen in the Tribune in either of the 85 or 86 Bull seasons. That was fantastic. I think you shared a photo of that on Twitter at some stage and under the at Bulls history account. You'd figure that maybe the, they were assuming that there weren't too many seven-footers or dinker drives in Chicago <laughs> at the time and wouldn't have to cough up for too many free tickets. I reckon they would have probably been able to count on one hand the number of... <laughs> Dinker tribesmen that would have attended <laughs> attended that game. So counting Manute. They could probably count them on one hand or seven feet. <laughs> nice. I like that. That's very good. And on the same date, Alex English bucked off hometown Milwaukee, scoring 42 of Denver's 119 points en route to the, or en route, depending on how you want to say it, to the Nuggets four-point win. Bob Sakamoto said that with their sameness, John Paxson and Kyle Macy were separated by the rest of the NBA, as no other team had two guards quite like them. The article highlighted the stable and consistent play of the two and that they were so alike. Rookie Charles Oakley calls Paxson Kyle and Macy John. And in noticing their similarities, River Banks calls them the regular guys. <laughs> that they weren't at each other's throats competing for minutes showed the unselfishness and professionalism of the two players. Agreed, mate. Agreed. Now, the 76ers chalked up their 13th win in 14 games with a 123 to 105 demolition job on the hometown New Jersey Nets. Barkley, Cheeks, Irving, and Sadal Threat, here we go again, episode 12, former podcast guest and friend of the show, all had 19 points for Philadelphia. The great Otis Birdsong chirped in with 23 points for the Nets. Why do I do that? Washington also took on the Chicago Bulls in Chicago Stadium on this date in front of 7,238 people. The final score, the Bullets defeated the Bulls 117 to 113, and the Bulls dropped 15 and 24. A few quick stats. For Chicago, Orlando Woolridge had 23 points and Sid Green had 9 boards. For Washington, Jeff Malone had 26 points. Leon Wood score the same number of points as Gus Williams with 22 and Dan Ranfield had 20 points and 14 rebounds and Manute Bowl the aforementioned Manute Bowl notched up 10 points nine rebounds and seven blocks so that was pretty impressive to say the least the Bulls were outscored though 39 to 27 in the fourth quarter which was pretty ordinary one of the most notable Bulls losses from the season was highlighted by some of the longest punches thrown in NBA history. Extraordinary. Seven foot seven Manu Bowl and seven one Jawan Oldham went at it like Ali and Frazier. Both players were ejected from the game after Minute said that Oldham had hit him in the back, which led to some unpleasantries, including some right crosses. <laughs> one which landed on Manute Bowl's jaw. On their way off the court, 
Oldham again launched at Minute and the two plus several teammates in trying to break it up ended up up against the scorer's table in what would have legitimately been a frightening situation for the regular-sized human beings at the scorer's bench. All this took place with 108 left in the game and the Bulls down by three points. There is a YouTube clip which hopefully will remain online for the rest of time, but there's a clip of that fracas. It was scary stuff. The, the footage is not great quality. It's not very clear, but you can certainly make out what's going on, and they were going for it hammer and tongs. I mean that sincerely for the you know, regular-sized people who are in the immediate vicinity. It would have actually been a very scary situation because they weren't holding back at all. It was crazy stuff. Bob Sakamoto then wrote, Overshadowed by the pugilism was another fourth quarter Bulls collapse. Oh, goodness. 1984 gold medalist Leon Wood scored 16 straight points in the fourth quarter for the Washington Bullets. Dan Ranfield commented that the altercation between Boll and Oldham probably stemmed from the first game when Oldham said he was going to dunk on Boll. Yeah, they certainly had history dating back to a previous game in this NBA 86 campaign that we have covered already. So they were going at it big time. Kyle Macy had no interest in trying to break up the two seven-footers and actually practice his three-pointers during the altercation. <laughs> and when Oldham came back for more, he went to Chicago Bear Otis Wilson, who was sitting courtside and wished him well for the Super Bowl. <laughs> oh, goodness me. That's Kyle style for you, isn't it? Kyle style. The sack said that Bowl, who had once killed a lion with his bare hands, can now also claim a raging bull. <laughs> <laughs> the fight, as it turned out, would cost Juwan $1,750 in fines and a suspension without pay, and Minute escaped with a $750 fine with no suspension. Oldham decided to keep himself from getting into further trouble and simply said post-game, how do I feel? I have a bad headache. <laughs> Leaving his sensationally named lawyer, Fred Slaughter, <laughs> to answer any questions from the media. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, you've said it all by saying <laughs> sensationally named. <laughs> oh, jeez. With a $1,750 fine and a one-game suspension and a $750 fine, respectively, how lightly do you think that they got off compared to what the, the numbers would be like today? That's right. I don't want to hark too much to 30 years hence and talk about this current day. However, they wouldn't be playing for probably the best part of a month and suspension is probably half a million, a million. Who knows the amount of money they'd miss out on. So, um, oh, incredible. Fred Slaughter. Wow, that is awesome. In one of the more extraordinary comments, Minute said he is not a machine. He could not just stand there and take it from Oldham. I am not a fighting man, said Minute. If I want to look for a fight, I'll go to Libya. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's obviously a lot of feeling between these two guys. Um Fascinating stuff, albeit not stuff you want to sort of glamorize and make a, a scene out of because it really was, as you said, quite frightening when you see the footage. Extraordinary footage. And on a non-NBA related side note, one of the great headlines by Sam Smith on an article covering the upcoming Super Bowl and the New England Patriots coach Raymond Berry, Sam wrote, Pat's ripen under Berry. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, Sam Smith, you are a champion. Take a bow. <laughs> and dare I say, former two-time guest of the podcast as well, Sam Smith. Thank you very much. In New Jersey's return, we're chatting about January 15 here. In New Jersey's return matchup versus the 76ers at Philadelphia, the Nets avenged their blowout loss, snapping the 76ers' five-game win streak in the process. Mo Cheeks' 17 points led the Sixers, and for New Jersey, Otis was definitely on birdsong with 27 points on 13-15 shooting. Darwin the chef Cook dished up 13 points, 15 assists, and 5 steals simultaneously handing out just desserts to Philadelphia in the 123-89 to smashing. Rumor has it that when asked about all of the points that he scored in the paint during this game and just how he did it, Darwin, the chef cook, responded, well, you'll never, never know if you never, never go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for our Australian listeners, that is absolute gold. <laughs> Hello to Daryl Summers, if you're listening. Uh, anybody that doesn't get that reference, that was a great slogan that the Northern Territory Tourist Commission must have had back in the day here in Australia. In Boston, the Celtics disposed of Denver 123 to 100, taking their record to 28 and 8. Alex Inglis's 22 points were a team high, 
whilst the Celtics' Kevin McHale dominated with 33 points and Larry Bird was just one assist shy of a triple-double with 24 points, 14 rebounds and 9 assists. Same day, Chicago visited Detroit in front of 10,350 fans. The final score, Detroit were winners 123-115 to and the Bulls were 15-25. and For Chicago, George Gervin had 27 points, Sidney Green 17 points and 14 rebounds and Kyle Macy 13 points and 10 assists. For Detroit, Isaiah Thomas bounced back to his regular stupendous form. 28 points, 12 assists and 5 steals. Bill Lambeer, 24 points and 11 boards. And Joe D, Vinny J and Tony C had <laughs> at least 10 plus each for the Pistons. They've never been called Vinny J and Tony C either. The Pistons' victory was just its third in their previous 15 outings. George Gervin scored 27 points through three quarters, then never stopped onto the court in the last quarter as Isaiah Thomas took over in the final six minutes. Zeke loved that he got to sit and watch I score at will through three quarters, but then saw him sit on the bench for the final 12 minutes as he took over. Several unusual things took place during this game, including Mount St. Albeck and referee Terry Durham had to be separated by security <laughs> as they started yelling at each other after Albeck disputed a dubious offensive foul call. Wow. Stan Albeck, obviously his temper is certainly getting the best of him during this season. The stresses of being an NBA coach go without saying. However, he uh, tried to take on Chuck Daly in a, a boxing match back in Chicago Stadium earlier in the season, and uh, now he's still getting fired up. The 15-25 and 25 record probably didn't help things either. Yeah, that wouldn't have been too much of a, uh, a help for the Bulls. The public address system died at the end of the third term, leaving the official timer to yell out the countdown clock <laughs> in the last minute of the game. Jeez. The game clock itself stopped, working midway through the third term. Bob Sakamoto said it looked more like the YMCA than the NBA. (laughs) (laughs) NBA history is the greatest. Boston travelled to Indiana and easily accounted for the Pacers, 123-105. to McHale led the 29-8 and Celtics with 28 points. Bird went 21-9-8 and and the Chief had 20 points. Rookie Wayman Tisdale, rest in peace, led the Pacers with 20 points and Clint Richardson and Terrence Stansbury added 16 points each. Philadelphia visited Chicago in front of 13,000, the cities actually didn't visit, in front of 13,765 for a 120 to 118 victory in overtime against the Bulls. Now Chicago dropped to 15 and 26, so they were really struggling. Chicago were led by George Gervin with 31 points. Sydney Green had a, a great game, 16 points and 8 boards. And Gene Banks, 12 points, 8 assists, 8 rebounds. For Philadelphia, Mo Cheeks had 28 points and 8 assists. Charles Barkley, 23 points. And Moses Malone, 23 points and 16 rebounds. You really see in this 86 season with the opportunities that he got to play that Sid Green really played quite well in a starting role for the Bulls this year, but you can see as the other season progresses, and in particular towards the end of this period and into the the next block of 15 days, the the impact that rookie Charles Oakley starts to have on the Bulls and why the the Bulls were so high in him and eventually moved on from Sid Green after this season. He certainly put in some great games and had good stretches of games where he dominated, got some great amount of points, you know, 15, 20, 25 point games and multiple 15 plus boards a game. Uh, So he did very well. On this game, the Bulls lost their fifth in six games in an intense overtime loss to Philadelphia. The Bulls had two chances late to finish off the sixes but couldn't capitalize. Constant doubling of Moses down low left Mo Cheeks open repeatedly for his team-high 28 points. In an all-back trend that seemed to appear on a regular basis during this season, one of Chicago's stars set the entire fourth quarter. Orlando Warridge said he had the best seat in the house for the intense finish. <laughs> How frustrating would that have been for Orlando, having to sit on the bench to watch this? Really some interesting substitution patterns and just game time decisions. In Atlanta, Larry Bird stunned the Hawks, scoring 41 points, leading Boston to a stirring 125-122 to overtime win. The Celtics trailed by as many as 27. Bird also tallied 7 boards, 6 assists, 3 steals and 2 blocks. Parrish had 22 points and 11 rebounds and Scott Wedman had 21 points. Dominique dominated the scoring column for Atlanta with 36 points, and Cliff Levingston was the next highest scorer with 15. Boston moved to 30-8. and 8. 
some more Bob Sakamoto gold the following day, January 19. Ali had his thriller in Manila, but don't expect Oldham to have his flap in the cap, wrote Bob Sakamoto. <laughs> oh, goodness. The wordplay. The Bulls returned to Washington to play the Bulls for the first time after Oldham and Bowl went toe-to-toe the previous Tuesday, costing Juwan a few thousand dollars in fines. Oldham extraordinarily said it was the first time he had ever lost his temper. Hmm. Wow. I do believe the words primed and ready to kill were used by <laughs> Oldham in the direction of Bill Lambeer just the previous season. We covered that in NB85. Kelly Chapuko came up huge, nailing a three-point basket with just two seconds left in Detroit's 118-115 to victory over the visiting LA Lakers. Joe Dumas had 18 points and 11 assists. And his backcourt pal, Isaiah Thomas, had 18 points and 10 assists. Lane Beer had 16 points and 11 boards. And for Los Angeles, the captain would wind back the clock and drop 38 points on 17 of 26 shooting in 39 minutes of play. James was more than worthy with 28 points. And the enforcer, Mo Lucas, had 15 points and 12 rebounds, whilst Magic had 10 points and 18 assists. The Lakers dropped to 31 and 7. And as I mentioned earlier, mate, here's the follow-up to the Isaiah Thomas possible quitting. In a random tidbit from the NBA Roundup, the Chicago Tribune mentioned that Isaiah Thomas told a reporter in an interview the day prior that his spirits were lifted when Magic Johnson sent him balloons. I guess they were helium balloons if they helped lift his spirits. Obviously, Isaiah, uh, a very sensitive soul back in the 85-86 season. Hmm. I know they were great friends. Interesting gift. Some balloons. I like balloons, but I mean, yeah. come on, Isaiah. Dial it back a bit, son. <laughs> Hello to Isaiah Thomas, if you're listening. Lord Thomas the Third. Right, sorry. I slouch corrected, as Peter Vessi likes to say. Does he really? Yeah, he does. Yeah. On a couple of tweets when people tell him that he's wrong, he says, I slouch corrected, <laughs> 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 which I find hilarious. Um, <laughs> Chicago visited Washington in front of 17,781 fans, and the Bullets defeated the Bulls 112-98. to Chicago continued to plummet. They dropped to 15-27. and for Chicago, Orlando Woolridge had 20 points and Dave Corzine, 18 points and 15 rebounds. So good stuff there from Dave. Washington were led by Jeff Malone, who had 40 points on 15 of 21 from the field. Dan Roundfield, 20 points and 8 rebounds. And Charles Jones, 10 points, 11 rebounds, 7 assists, 3 steals and 6 blocks. Stellar performance. Jones played three games with the Bulls in the previous season. We covered that during NB85. He went on to win a championship ring in 1995 with Houston. And one of Jones's three brothers who played in the NBA, Caldwell, also laced him up with Chicago to the tune of 44 games, also in that 85 campaign. Got off to a fast start that season too as the starting centre for the Bulls and then suffered some injuries uh, through the season and, and then was a forgotten man by the end of the 84-85 season. By the end of the season, it was very hard to keep up with the Joneses. Very. That's pathetic. In the ongoing issues of Quinton Daly, he was excused from his third practice in the previous 11 days to deal with some personal issues related to his brother. A crowd of 17,781, double that of the Bullets' average crowd this season, saw the Bulls drop their fourth straight. It makes you wonder how many of them were hoping for round two between Minute, the Lion Tamer Bowl, and Jawan Hammertime Oldham. Was that in the paper, or that's just what you've dubbed them? That's me. <laughs> they settled for Jeff Malone's career-high 40 points on 15 for 21 shooting and Charles Jones and Manu Bowl blocking six shots apiece. The Bulls had the Bullets lead down to five in the third term, but 16 points in the quarter from Malone didn't let them get any closer than that for the rest of the game. Q, Ice and Green shot a combined eight for 43 from the field, including an 0 for 11 game from Quinton Daly. Wow. Later that day, mate, the LA Lakers visited Chicago Stadium in front of 17,284 and the Lakers held off the Bulls 133 to 118. Another loss dropping to 15 and 28. Now for Chicago, Woolridge had 23 points and 11 rebounds and Jawan Oldham 17 points and 8 boards. For the Lakers, James Worthy had 33 points and 8 rebounds. Kareem had 27 points. Magic had 24 points and 14 assists. And the enforcer, Maurice Lucas, 15 points and 12 rebounds for the 32-7 and seven LA Lakers. Great start to the season. Mm. What the Bulls fans did see was the defending world champs blow the Bulls out at Chicago Stadium. What they didn't see was the messy situation that Bulls GM Jerry Krause was dealing with 
in regards to problem child Quinton Daly. The three practices and one flight missed in an 11-day stretch was causing crumbs to intimate that Q was on his last warning with the Bulls after he had discovered holes in Daly's reasons for his absenteeism during the span of time. Krauss added the Bulls' responsibilities in handling a situation such as Daly's in that it is very difficult for a team to waive a player who has been through the NBA's drug rehabilitation program. Daly's missed practices had Krauss worried, despite, to his knowledge, Daly having followed the after-rehab program that he had set out for him. Yep, a very precarious scenario that they were in at that stage, trying to to help rehabilitate Daly, also look after his best interests. However, also they had to draw a line at some stage where enough was enough, so the saga continued. New York required overtime to defeat the visiting Golden State Warriors 121 to 114 at Madison Square Garden. Ewing delivered a monster game with 29 points, 13 rebounds and 4 blocks. Gerald Wilkins was the next high man for New York with 16 points. For Golden State, Purvis was nothing short of fabulous. He scored 34 points. New York was 15 and 27, not much better than the Warriors at 14 and 31. And former St. John star Chris Mullen returned to New York for the first time as a pro and had 11 points. The LA Clippers' Marcus Johnson had 30 points, including 14 in the fourth quarter, as the Clippers held off the hometown San Antonio Spurs 97-96. Alvin Robertson dialed up 24 points, 8 rebounds, 11 assists and 5 steals for San Antonio. Great stuff there from Alvin. In the midst of a Bulls three-day break in between games, George Gervin attended his alma mater, Eastern Michigan, as they retired his number 24 jersey during their game against... Holy Toledo, here comes Mr. Gervin is right. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. A shout-out to Milo Hamilton. Rest in peace. Of course, who who was the uh, architect of that Holy Toledo call? As I mentioned near the start of the episode, mate, we'd refer back to Dr. John Hefferon, and on the 22nd of January, to close out this episode, the Bulls physician removed Michael Jordan's cast. He was then placed in a splint for two weeks. If all went to plan, his first game back was anticipated to be February 14 or February 16. That was the latest update at that stage. The travelling LA Lakers took on Boston, but were sent home packing to the tune of 110-95. to It was the first meeting between the teams since the 85 NBA Finals. For the 31-8 and eight Celtics, Dennis Johnson led all scorers with 22 points and Larry Bird had 21 points, 12 rebounds, 7 assists and 3 steals. Kareem had 17 points for the Lakers, who were 32-8 and eight after that loss. You'd figure for any matchups in NBA history that that would be one, the Lakers and the Celtics back in the 80s, that the two teams wouldn't have any trouble getting up for. Oh, no doubt, mate. Denver exploded for 137 points, defeating the New Jersey Nets by 13, thanks largely to an English lesson that only Alex could teach. He detonated New Jersey with 43 points, which was the sixth time this season he'd gone for 40-plus. In Dallas, Marcus Johnson was again the main man, leading his Clippers to a victory, and he had 22 points, and they cruised to a win 131-118. to Kurt Nymphius also contributed a very impressive 21 points and 14 rebounds for the Clips. The Mavericks were paced by Derek Harper's 26 points. Let's move straight into the Players of the Week for January 12th. Calvin Natt of the Denver Nuggets averaged 22.7 points, 11 rebounds and 2.7 assists per game as Denver went 3-zip. On the 19th of January, Larry Bird of Boston, of course, 28.7 points, 10 rebounds, 7.7 assists and 2 steals per game and Boston went 3-0. The individual highs for this period of time, Purvis Short had 44 points for the Golden State Warriors at Dallas on the 11th of January. Rebounds, 21. LaSalle Thompson of Sacramento at Indiana on the 8th of January. And Matty Johnson had 19 assists for the Lakers versus the Phoenix Suns on the 14th. Now, the NBA standings through January 22, our division leaders were in the Atlantic, Boston with 31-8. and eight. In the Central, Milwaukee were 28 and 15. In the Midwest, Houston were 28 and 14. And in the Pacific, the LA Lakers were 32 and 8. The Bulls were 15 and 28. They went 1 and 5 in this particular period of time. And were, I don't think they were enjoying, but uh, my notes say they're enjoying a five game losing streak, which is probably not possible. Um, Indiana were 11 and 30 in the bottom of the NBA's standings. So, mate, that rounds out another episode of the show. Episode 8 is almost in the books. Would you like to add anything before we 
end this episode, mate. Again, thanks for being part of the show, as always. Don't want to be too much of a tease, but I'm really looking forward to the other next 15-day block and a couple of quite important turning points for the Bulls and their season uh, of 85-86. Giddy up. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at InAllAnnis. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash InAllAnnis. Join me next time for another edition of the show. John Sakamoto said that with... John, <laughs> John Sakamoto. That's not the first time I've said that either. And the Philadelphia, why am I saying the name again? Philadelphia, I said it again twice. The <laughs> 76ers for Washington. Mo Cheeks. Mo Cheeks played for Washington. Hmm, that's interesting. Goodness me, fix up your document, Adam. And that's not me either. I haven't played with your notes, I promise. They settled for Jeff Malone's career-high 40 points on apparently 15 for 12 shooting, which is just extraordinary. That's incredible shooting.